Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this, the final day of the Lahore Literary Festival. I'm going to begin this session with a quote. And in order to give you this quote, I'm going to have to assume the voice of the great British writer J.G. Ballard. The American dream has run out of gas. The car has stopped. It no longer supplies the world with its images, its dreams, its fantasies. No more. It's over. It supplies the world with its nightmares now. The Kennedy assassination, Watergate, Vietnam. That was J.G. Ballard speaking in 1983. So why is it that the idea of the American dream still holds sway today? Why is it that Barack Obama, when he was first elected as President of the United States, suggested that he was evidence that the American dream lives on? Well, that's one of the conversations we'll be talking about today, one of the issues. My name is Nick Barley. I'm the director of the Edinburgh International Book Festival, and it's my great honor to be your moderator today. And I would simply like to begin with just a side note to congratulate Razi Ahmed and all of the organizers of this fantastic festival in Lahore. I go to a lot of festivals, and let me tell you, you're really onto something here. The extraordinary audiences and the fantastic conversations. So well done. Today's session is called Illusion and Disillusion, the American Dream in the Arts. And joining me on stage to discuss this are three extraordinary, exceptional writers. To my far right, Mohsen Hamid, author of three novels, including his international bestseller, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, and most recently, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. Please welcome Mohsen Hamid. In the middle, Tanya James, Indian-American writer, author of two novels and a book of short stories, and who will be talking today about her latest novel, The Tusk That Did the Damage. Tanya. <laughs> and closest to me, the British writer Ned Bowman, author of three novels, who will be talking today about his Man Booker long-listed novel, The Teleportation Accident. Please give him a warm round of applause. So let's just kick off before we uh, invite the authors to speak about the American dream. What exactly do we mean by that phrase? Well, those of you who've done your homework will know that it was invented in 1931 by an American historian, James Adams, in his book, The Epic of America. The dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for every man, with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievement. That was the idea of the American dream. So why is it in a recent poll in the USA 59% of American people said they no longer believe in the American dream. They don't believe it exists and it's become impossible to achieve. So let's find out from our authors what they think the American dream means now. Let's start with you, Mohsen. What, what are the elements of the American dream? Um, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing, the American dream. I think um, it's, a, it's a potent idea that you know, in Pakistan, as we know, uh, one of the big Pakistani dreams is to you know, get the hell out of Pakistan and go to America. Um, and there's a different question about what should the Pakistani dream be and what can it be, and I'd love to talk about that. But um, I think the idea that you, know, you can go to a place and reinvent yourself and make of yourself what you would like to be, the, make the imaginary you that you would like to exist actually come into existence, is the most potent aspect of the American dream. Um, and the question is, you know, to what extent has it been true, or is it true, or, um, and and uh, uh, you know, obviously America um, has been a country where enormous number of people have achieved, you know, material wealth and um, has produced amazing literature and art, and and yet, you know, as your J.G. Ballard quote says, America has also given you know the world great nightmares. Um, it's uh, it's a mixed phenomenon. Um, I think in Pakistan, you know, you, the, there's, there's an American dream of what people, you know, aspire to when they go to America. 
But there's another kind of American dream, which is that it, it sometimes feels it feels as if you know America um, is dreaming about the rest of the world. And you look at how Pakistan appears in sort of the U.S. media and in American discourse, and it very often has very little connection to what life here actually feels like, at least you know to me. So. So there is this potent pull and also this illusion at the same time. And the last thing I'd say about this is, um, and this is not meant to be an insult or a critique, I think to a certain extent the idea of the American dream is getting to be less and less important because um, other places are becoming more and more important. And America in the 20th century, you know, from 1930 when this quote originated, this, this idea, um, you know, through until quite recently was this dominant force all over the world. Um, but, uh, but other places are becoming increasingly independent and they're growing and they're becoming their own thing and there's multiple pulls and, you know, there's Brazil and China and India and even Pakistan. And so, so in a way, I think discussing the American dream in Pakistan today is to speak about something which is, you know, interesting but definitely not the be-all, end-all, or as important as maybe it was, what, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, I mean, there are many different ways you could look at the American dream. One is the notion of getting extremely rich, being extremely successful. But then there's another more modest idea, which would be about simply just having enough, a small house and education for your children and just getting by. Yeah. And, and it strikes me as extraordinary that, that America appropriated this fairly ordinary ambition which, which everybody in the world seems to have. Yeah. I mean, uh, Martin Luther King talked about, I have a dream. That was a de direct reference to the American dream. But equally, Mao said, to get rich is glorious. So even in Chinese communist society, the idea of getting wealthy um, is an aspiration. Uh, so it doesn't only belong to America, right? Yeah, it doesn't only belong to America. And I think if you think of, of um, I mean, one of the most common conversations I have with my friends in Pakistan is, you know, should we leave? And I think that's a, it's a conversation that many Pakistanis have internally or explicitly. And, and you know, the other day my uh, uh, cable television service broke down and the repairman came to fix the, you know, cable television. And we were talking and he was saying how he actually wanted to leave and go to Dubai. Um, and so I think that, you know, in much of the world, this basic idea of having a decent life, that you work reasonably hard, you can support yourself, and you can sort of get ahead, um, that feels almost out of reach. And whether you call that the American dream or something else, um, it, it is really a human aspiration. Yeah. And, and here in Pakistan, you know, it, it's, being, it's being very substantially you know, unmet. Um, and, uh, 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 and I think the one thing which is perhaps changing is, although Pakistanis realize that in Pakistan this dream is not being met, um, I think people are also beginning to realize that perhaps in America it's not being met either. Right. That, well, uh, that there may not be an American dream in America anymore, or yeah. it might be less than it was. Well, I think we'll come back to the Pakistani situation when we talk about your novels in a moment. But Tanya, I just want to turn to you. As a, a woman of Indian descent who, who's uh, been brought up in America, um, the, the immigrant communities in America, of whom there are many, to, what's the American dream mean for them? Well, I mean, I, my parents came in 1975 along with that wave of skilled professionals, and so um, I think, to their minds, they've benefited a great deal from, from this idea of the American dream, although I think they would find that phrase kind of corny. I mean, dream seems to suggest um, that things kind of happen easily, and there are a lot of points of uncertainty along their path. But, I, I think my perspective now is somewhat more cynical because I live in Washington, D.C., and it's a campaign year. So this phrase is just used over and over again as a means of evoking nostalgia. And, um, and I think that, you know, you're absolutely right that um, there's a sense within America that, especially among um, white, middle class, working class people, um, that we are no longer, we are in a post-industrialist phase, we are not what we used to be, and and there's this sense of the American dream. I think phrases like that, or make America great again, they are sort of used to, you know, evoke nostalgia for an America that for a lot of people never really was. Um, for a lot of, you know, people who are born poor, born black and poor, that, that just isn't true. 
Um, so I think that campaign years kind of make me uncomfortable with language like that. Maybe last year I felt better about it, I don't know. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think we probably all feel a bit uncomfortable with the notion but it's good to have you here on the panel as somebody who represents the American voice as well as an Indian voice. Uh, and we'll come back to, again, to, to that uh, dichotomy when we come back to your novel in a second. But I want to turn to you, Ned, and just, ch just check out how you feel about the American dream from a British perspective. I mean, you could, you could argue, perhaps, that Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan gave us the ultimate manifestation of the, kind of the, the idea of the American dream in the, in the individualism that they loved so much, which still, I think, in, in Western societies, still drives the way we live. Is that how you feel? Um, well, I mean, it, yeah, it is tempting to regard what happened to the UK in the 80s as a sort of unwelcome American export. Um, but it was, one could also say we were, that was going to happen anyway, we were just waiting for it and the Americans happened to package it in a very convenient form that we could just slot in. Um, from my point of view also, um, as well as distinguishing the American dream of getting very rich and the American dream of just providing a decent life for your family, uh, for me also there's a difference between the American dream of escaping a sort of messed up country and the American dream of escaping a messed up life. The latter of the two is a bit more decadent because it doesn't imply anything forcing you out. You just want to get out. So, um, you know, throughout the 20th century, a lot of the people going from Europe to America were people who'd embezzled from their companies or even committed murders or whatever. And they had a sort of American dream in that they could have a new life where their crimes wouldn't follow them. Um, and all of us have crimes of a kind. And still, I think, people go to America often, especially from the UK, not because the life there is necessarily going to be any better, but just because... Um, it's a new life. And I remember um, in 2011, um, I applied for a five-year visa to the US because I wanted to spend some time there. Um, and when the guy at the, be the American embassy in Berlin, when the guy at the embassy stamped my passport with a five-year visa after none of the interrogation that I was expecting, I felt this absolute euphoria because even just a visa to New York, if there were such a thing, would be inexpressibly exciting. But in this case, it was a visa not only to New York, but to Los Angeles and San Francisco and Miami and Marfa, Texas and the forests of the Pacific Northwest and everywhere else um, on most of the continent. So that dream of just a huge country all of which speaks a language which you probably already know at least a few words of, where there's every kind of climate, every way of life, there's enclaves of people from every country in the world, including certainly whatever country you happen to come from. That sense of infinite possibility, even if the economics aren't really working, this, this kingdom that you get the key to when you get a visa to America. I think that dream still exists. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that, that's a beginning overview about the different possibilities that are and carried within this strange phrase. It's not only America, but America has somehow appropriated this word. Now, this is a literary festival, and I think it's very important that we hear how writers engage with the world and how novels help us make sense of, of these kinds of ideas. And so, uh, in this next section of, of the event, I would like us to, to, to hear a bit about your novels and then we'll come back to these ideas of the American dream and illusions and hopes and aspirations through the lens of the novels that these great writers have written. So Mosin, I'd like to start with you. Um, and Two of your novels I think are relevant to this discussion. They're The Reluctant Fundamentalist and How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. So could you just tell us a bit about, the, just in, in a nutshell, tell us about the stories that, that you tell in those two novels. So, The Reluctant Fundamentalist is a story about a Lahori guy who goes off to study at Princeton and then gets a job working in New York City, a very high paying job. And he's there just as the September 11th attacks occur. 
and he moves back to Pakistan. He grows a beard, moves back to Pakistan. Uh, he has a love affair which comes to an end, and uh, and he meets somebody who probably is an American in a uh, Lahori bazaar, actually in Purani Narkali, which is probably just 10 minutes walk from here. And he um, starts talking to this unnamed American, and we hear one side of their conversation. Um, and, and that novel really, for me, uh, you know, was about, um, in some ways, a very p personal story because I, I you know, have, uh, I keep moving to America. So when I was three years old, my, my father got into a PhD in, in California and the whole family moved to California. And then when I was nine, I came back to Lahore. And when I was 18, I went back to university in the States and then I came back and, um, and you know, I live in Lahore now. Uh, I've lived in America less than Lahore, but not much less, you know, uh, probably maybe 15 of my 44 years in the States and maybe 20-ish in Lahore. And uh, uh, so, in a way, the story of Chinggis was um, not exactly my story, but an alternate reality version of my story, yeah. where in my own life, I've kind of come to the conclusion that you don't have to pick sides. In fact, it's a false choice that you are supposed to pick sides, that you can be a very messy, mongrelized person, and that's just fine. And in fact, probably all of us are messy, mongrelized people. But, but, but the defining to, moment in that novel is, is where it's 2001. Yeah. When the Twin Towers come down. Exactly. So Twin Towers come down, and, and our character, our hero, Chinggis, is in New York, and he's, you know, he, as many of us in Lahore, who remember that, although. It's funny, now that I speak of this novel, I sometimes go to universities and, and lecture about this and, and the kids don't remember September 11th because they were too young to really have any, which is strange. Um, but anyway, for those of you who remember, there was this time when the bombing of Afghanistan began and the war in Afghanistan began and all the stuff was going on and um, it was a very you know, dangerous time, it felt like, in Pakistan. And Chinggis feels he has to pick. You know, is he an American? Is he a Pakistani? Is he a Muslim? Is he a, you know, what is he? And so I wanted to write the story of somebody who felt that they had to choose. And for Chinggis, in many ways, it, you know, the American dream is something he feels he can't participate anymore in. Anymore. Yeah. And, and to some extent also, sorry for, for interrupting, the, the, the choice is forced upon him because the attitudes to a Pakistani man in New York change yeah. over the course of the weeks which follow the, the Twin Towers coming down. Well, I mean, that's part of it, right? So, so in America, you know, people like us, the sort of brown people of Pakistan, didn't really fit into America's racial categories very clearly before. There were you know, African Americans against whom there was a very long history of, of you know, almost unspeakable discrimination. Um, and there were white people. But Asian people were sort of, neither, it depended where in the country you were, but if you were in New York or San Francisco or places like that, it was you know, pretty, that changed really after September 11th. Uh, Pakistanis became suspect in a way they never were before. And Chinggis feels this. But that said, even though he feels this difference, and many, I think, of us who have been to America recently and you get stopped at the airport and um, you feel a little bit of this change environment, um, still, the choice isn't forced upon Chinggis. He's doing very well professionally. You know, he's in love, he has a great job, he's making lots of money. Um, he's a suspect, but he's also a success. Um, and he chooses, in a way. Uh, uh, he chooses, in, in a sense, in the way that you know, both Osama bin Laden you know, and perhaps George W. Bush were encouraging people to do. You're either with us or against us. He sort of believes this. He has to be one or the other, and yeah. he chooses. And so, in a way, um, in a, you're either with us or against us world, the American dream becomes more complex for a guy like Chinggis. And that, that was that novel. And then, in How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, um, that is a novel where the characters have no names and it takes place in a country that has no name and um, but of course it's a lot like this country and uh, um, and that's in a sense um, there is one version of this American dream which has become global which is that you know the dream is to make a lot of money in Pakistan as we know um, the legal system works differently if you have money uh, the police treat you differently if you have money you have a generator, so you don't have load shedding. You have, you know, uh, private schools, so you don't suffer from bad schools. You have a, uh, a land cruiser, so even if the roads are bad, it doesn't make a difference. You have guards, so the police don't. So 
um, money has become a kind of you know way of uh, um, uh, uh, I like the disco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is the filthy if, rich. If, if you have money, your life is one giant party. You know? <laughs> uh, and um, and so and so, I think what I wanted to do in that novel really was to explore. I mean, you know, one version of the American dream, which is that the, the economic version, um, in a place like Pakistan and all over Asia. You know, travel to India or China, and people are obsessed with money because the. The, what happens to you if you don't have money is so bleak that you have, you have sort of no option but to obsess about money. Um, and yet at the same time, I wanted to explore a kind of counter narrative to that, which is that in this part of the world, you know, we have many, in all over the world, we have many responses to this predicament which has been here. And so, you know, here we have things like Sufi poetry, right, which, which tells us that um, many things, but that, you know, um, love is a way to make yourself less central to your own life and so and so the oppression you feel in your life including the oppression of mortality the fact that you're going to die one day maybe can be slightly disarmed through emotion yeah anyway so I wanted to, to sort of in a sense juxtapose with this American dream or Asian dream um, a kind of older you could say Pakistani dream or Sufi dream and see how the two could play out next to each other yeah, and it, I, it, I think it's striking to me that in both of these novels, which feature a character who, who is going through various levels of increasing success for a period, that there's a love story underpinning it in each one. And, and the love is, is, a, is a tussle between the materialism, uh, which is the kind of backdrop, and their the love, which is, is not, obviously not material, but it's some, something yeah. else. I mean, it's a very important point, because I think, you know, when, when people say that, oh, well, in the West, uh, I mean, I think terms like the West are kind of meaningless, that... You know, many people here are of the West, and there are many people living in the West who are of here, and so these terms don't really work. But when people say things like in the West, you know, it's about individualism, um, maybe to a certain extent it might be more so. But if you then, then think in a place like Pakistan, what is the highest value? Um, and in many ways, I'd say if you think, you know, what is the most celebrated value? What is the thing that people, you know, really think is the most heroic thing in Pakistan? You know, I think really that the, at the core value there is, is, is you know, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, what, what turns our lights on is, is the idea of um, of love. Yeah. So you know, you have shrines in Lahore that have been here for a thousand years that people still come to every single day in their thousands because somebody there wrote a poem about love, and um, uh, and I think you know that that that. Uh, um, it's not really a juxtaposition of, of individualism is one world view and the oppression of your society is the other thing that everybody else is you know, drawn to. Um, but that, that's, that individualism, while important, doesn't actually give us a way out of this trap of being you know, a sack of blood and bones and flesh that's going to die one day. And so societies have other things. Um, and in a place like Pakistan, in a way, what you've seen happen is this other narrative, this love narrative, um, uh, is is being increasingly squeezed? You know, it's 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 um, the aspects of religious expression of love of being shut down in the face of a kind of more tyrannical form of religion, and um, and and money is making it more difficult for families to and people to you know uh, focus on things like that. And so, yeah. anyway, I think I think it's a it's an interesting thing, which is. Um, uh, uh, and in both novels, which is, you know, to what extent does love have a way out? What what kind of love is that? Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know, is there is there sort of a romantic dream that you can set alongside or in contradiction to the American dream? Yeah. Well, this is a good moment to turn to you, Tanya, where the, the tussle between love and money is is very evident in your novel as well. So we're going to get on an airplane and fly from Lahore to India, <laughs> South India. Uh, to the scene of your novel, The Tusk That Did the Damage. Tell us about the... Uh, um, well, the novel um, is... I, well, I started mostly writing about an elephant, and it was kind of uh, sort of an aesthetic experiment more than anything else. I wanted to see if I could write from the perspective of an elephant and not have it be something fanciful or whimsical, but have it uh, attempt something that's sort of psychologically realist. Um, 
So it's from the perspective of a an elephant that is a wild rogue elephant and who's killing people um, around in the farms that surround a wildlife park. Um, and what's strange about this elephant is that he buries the victims that he the people that he kills. So um, the the novel follows uh, that perspective involves two other characters. One is a farmer who's drawn into poaching because of his uh, conflicts with this elephant. And the third perspective is that of an American filmmaker who comes to India uh, to this wildlife park to make a film about conservation. And so the novel kind of rotates and closes in on this moment of violence that impacts um, impacts all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the, the, the central character, in a sense, of the novel is this elephant. And, and when you embark on the novel, you think, can I really get inside the head of an elephant? And you do. And it's an extraordinary achievement to, to have created this, this elephantine personality, which is, which is not whimsical, and it's not anthropomorphized. You know it's an elephant. But around this elephant is this industry of poaching, the, the tusk, which is, has such value, and the kind of conflicting ideologies of the, the locals who, who are trying to find a way to exist, um, and these, these Americans who arrive with their, with their ideas of conservation and, and the idea that they're going to uncover the nastiness of the local poachers. Mm -hmm. And they get into a kind of conflict, or, 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 which, is, which is a kind of international conflict, I, I feel. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that the main flaw that these filmmakers have is that they don't have a sense of the political and the ecological situation to which they're stepping and they think that they can make a film about that is truth-telling and fair to their own vision and fair to the subjects and they are sort of at times hypocritical about the questions that they ask their subjects and the way they ask these questions and um, and I think you know and the hypocrisy comes from the fact that you know America has made terrible contributions to climate change and um, to the world's ongoing extinctions. Um, and so I think, you know, kind of trying to rotate the, among these different perspectives as a way of kind of um, allowing us to, um, yeah, I don't know, allowing us to see a problem that in the press I think it's very obvious that, the, that poachers are referred to as these kind of villains when they're really at the bottom of a very complex network. Um, and, you know, I, to be honest, I thought, you know, giving a voice to an elephant wasn't that difficult. It was more difficult to give a voice to a poacher because I think the reader comes with a lot more um, bias against a poacher. And I also think those circumstances of this person are very grim and very serious. And so I, I, for a long time, I just could not access this character. And it was only until I read, I don't know if you guys have read um, True History of the Kelly Gang by Peter Carey. Oh my god, I love that book. It, yeah. And it was when I read that voice, it was a voice that had both gravity and levity, and it's by Peter Carey. Um, and, and I thought, okay, well that's the way into the character, is, is through a voice that can, that can be flexible and funny. And, um, and so, yeah, I actually, I found it harder to, to voice that. Yeah, yeah. And, and the poacher character and, and the various family members are very sympathetically rendered in a way which is surprising. But what they, what they, what's carried within this novel is the kind of ideological battle, I think. This notion that the Americans bring with them that essentially the American way, the liberal uh, intellectual way, is kind of the, the way that the whole world is going. And then the assumption that everybody in the world will eventually assume the kind of American democratic liberal model, which of course, you know, why should, why should we assume that? Yeah. Why should they assume that? So there's a kind of arrogance from the American perspective, which, which is inherent in between the words that you write, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is an idea that conservation is an American export. That, you know, um, that somehow it's something we are bringing, or that I think these filmmakers might have this idea, uh, that that's something we're bringing to India, when it, it's totally not true. And, you know, uh, conservation movements have been happening since the 70s with Chipko movement and so many others. And so um, I think you know, we're talking about the American dream and American exports. I think that's one kind of flagrant error they make. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, uh, now we have a third writer here, and, and a very different situation. So let, let's just get into, into your head a bit, Ned, with your extraordinary 
book, The Teleportation Accident, your second novel. Um, tell us about uh, Adele Hitler and Lerzer and so on. Um, well, so my, The Teleportation Accident is, uh, it starts in about 1934, I think. Um, and it's about a German expressionist set designer who emigrates from Weimar Berlin to Los Angeles. Um, sort of in pursuit of a girl who happens to be called Adele Hitler, but also sort of just because he's so sick of his old life. Um, and it was inspired by reading about the Weimar emigres like uh, Brecht and Schoenberg and Thomas Mann and Fritz Lang and Adorno and so on. Um, all of whom were forced to leave uh, Germany because of the Nazis and ended up in California and just hated it there. They thought it was just plastic and insipid and it was all false politeness and commercialism and kind of mass production and lowest common denominator art. And I found it hilarious to imagine these very grumpy geniuses sort of playing tennis in the sunshine in Santa Monica and grumbling about it to each other, about how much they wish they were back in rainy, decaying, modernist Berlin. Um, so I wanted to do not a character who wasn't exactly them, but was like them, um, and sort of goes to America for exactly the wrong reasons. So he is completely oblivious to the changing political situation in Germany and moves to America only in pursuit of this girl that he has no chance with and also because he's fallen out with all of his friends back in Berlin and he thinks um, America could be a new start for him and he gets there and feels just the same way as the Weimar emigres did. He can't imagine staying more than a week and then ends up for various reasons staying most of a lifetime. But actually in um, all of the three books I've published so far, I think there is a sort of westward pull. So the first and the third aren't about migration in that way, but in both of them, a character ends up at least briefly in New York, or in the third one, actually, he ends up at Newark Airport in a hotel, but he can see across the Hudson River to the Lower East Side. And in both cases, they see New York and think, this is it, this is so much better, rather in the same way that I did the first time I moved to New York for a while. Um, but uh, things don't work out and they don't hang on there and they end up sort of sluiced back into the gutter of London uh, as they see it also, rather in the same way that I did. Yeah. But the, the central character in the teleportation accident, basically he, he hasn't had sex for a long time and he's desperate to have sex, and he falls in love with an unattainable woman, and he chases her ar around the world. And the extraordinary thing about the novel is, is that the backdrop is, is Nazi Germany, rising Nazi Germany, and all his friends are struggling with the, the, this existential threat, many of them are Jewish, and th this guy he completely ignores what's going on in the background, and is sing singularly in pursuit of sex. You know, yeah, and, he, and he fails, he is a loser. His name is Loser, but you can read it as Loser. Uh, it's like the ultimate Walter Mitty character who, who thinks that eventually if he has sex, he'll be successful. So his pursuit of his American dream is, is a different kind of, is a sensual one. Yeah, well, so the, I wanted to do that because I felt like the plot of basically all historical novels, including my own first novel, is love affair torn asunder by larger historical forces. <laughs> and I, after writing my own first novel, I started to feel like that was a bit false. Like, the vast, vast majority of love affairs, even during the most turbulent times in history, are torn asunder for much smaller reasons than historical forces. So historical novels are giving this very kind of disproportionate uh, account of how breakups happen. So I wanted, to, um, I wanted to write about a love affair that was sort of torn apart despite historical forces. So I wanted a character, and I wanted it to happen at the extreme. So um, I had the kind of 
looming holocaust, as in the worst thing that's ever happened, is the thing that he ignores. And just being desperate to sleep with this girl who's way too young for him and not interested is the most trivial motivation, the most trivial and kind of contemptible motivation someone can possibly have for anything. So that, that was how I wanted to be counter to the normal historical novel. Rather than a noble, star-fated love that cannot ignore the press of history, I wanted uh, absolutely kind of disgusting, loveless sexual impulse that completely blocks out history. And it just happens that he go, ends up in California at the same time as all of his old enemies who are going for what we think of as the right reasons. Um, and of course, Lurster is horrified um, to find that all these people that he's known for years and never liked are in California too. Yeah. But, uh, and in the pursuit of that, of sex, I think it's analogous to the pursuit of material wealth that we get in How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. This notion that, that you know, the character feels that when he finally gets to have sex with this woman, he'll be happy. But of course you know, the underlying drive of the novel is, is that it, if it ever happens, he won't be happy anyway, it won't be enough. And it comes back to your point, Mosin, about, about something beyond the material uh, goods. Which, which the American dream provides. So uh, I, I hope you can get a sense that in three extraordinarily different and brilliant novels, there's this, this notion of material wealth and well-being which under, uh, underpins all of them. And, and so it's very hard to escape the American dream. So uh, I, I want to kind of come draw out now from the specifics of the novels to think about the, the way that the political world in which we live inevitably gets into a writer's brain when they're writing a novel. Each of these novels has got a, a kind of political backdrop, whether it's 9-11, whether it's the kind of conservation movement or, or Nazism in Berlin. It's there in the background. How do you, as a writer, how do you deal with, with political realities and, and spin stories around that? Most um, You know, it's... Uh, when I was writing The Relative Fundamentalist, the... the um, a part of the problem was uh, how to keep it a story in the face of this politics. So um, I wrote the first draft of Rotten Fundamentalist and gave it to my agent in July 2001. And it was the story of a uh, Pakistani guy working in New York City who grows a beard and goes back to Lahore and has a sort of doomed love affair before he goes back. That's exactly what the novel is today, but my agent in the summer of 2001 and he said, you know, Mohsen, I don't really, I don't really like it. It's, you need to do more work on it. And also, this whole thing is Muslim man in America. He feels this sort of tension. He has to go back. And civilizations are, you know, at loggerheads. I don't really buy it, you know. And then a month or two later, of course, September 11th happens, and, uh, and the whole world explodes. And, you know, uh, and my agent about a month later says, you know, that story about the Muslim man, you know, feels this tension with America. How's that uh, coming along? And, um, uh, and, and unfortunately, the book didn't come along for another six years. Because at that point, I was sort of thinking, I didn't mean to write the, you know, the prequel to September 11. I, I was sort of writing this quiet fable about a guy who falls in love with America and then has his heart broken by America, in a way. Yeah. Um, and, so, uh, and so the politics was kind of overwhelming, really. Um, but eventually, I started writing it, kept set, setting it before September 11th, and I re rewrote it eventually around September 11th. Um, and for me, you know, enough time had passed by the time the novel took its final form, five or six years after September 11th, uh, maybe five years, that I thought I could just write about this thing and have September 11th sort of be in the backdrop. But, um, uh, uh, you know, it, I, I didn't want to write a journalism piece about September 11. Um, and I think in Pakistan too, you know, there's, there's, if you turn on the TV at night, um, most of what people are watching is TV talk shows, you know, um, about politics. There's some dramas and there's sometimes these days there's cricket being played, but, but a lot of what people are watching is, is basically conversations about politics. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and while 
I think I've written novels that are very political in a way. Uh, I don't think politics is the only thing a novel should be doing, or even the most important thing. No, no. I, yeah. I think it was it Kafka who said uh, novels are a lie that help reveal the truth. Yes, uh, it's important that novels are made up, and, and however truthful they can feel, and, and, I, and I think in particular, a reluctant fundamentalist feels very truthful. It's nevertheless still a fable. It's made up. Yeah, yeah it, is, it, is, it is made up. It is a fable, and I think you know. Um, uh, Living in Pakistan, I feel very much that there's this sort of oppression of politics on life. Like, life is so fraught. You know, will there be a war with India? You know, is China going to build an economic corridor? Will the government sanction the Lahore Literary Festival to go ahead? You know, <laughs> Probably these, not. Are the, these are the you know, uh, issues of the day, and they're yeah. every day. Um, so, so, in a way, you know, um, what I sort of come to and what I try to do in my writing a little bit is is the politics is sort of there, but the novel isn't really meant to proclaim a particular political view. No. Um, it's, it's meant to go inside a reader, and inside the reader to have funny stuff happen. Um, and so that the fundamentalist is a half conversation. The reader has to supply the second half. And, yeah. and, and How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia is a self-help book that tells you how to get filthy rich in Rising Asia, which also happens to be a novel. Yeah. Um, and I think in that sense, you know, uh, what novels can do, which is quite interesting in the backdrop of politics is, um, novels, instead of the rest of politics and political conversation, which tends to come at you from the outside, novels can be inside people. Um, you know, you're sitting alone and the novel is just in your head, and it's differently in your head than everybody else's head. And that kind of intimate interior creation that readers do with novels for me is, is really important actually because um, uh, it's not that useful for me to tell people how it is. Um, it's kind of more interesting for me to say, you know, let's kind of play with this together. And, and that's, that's sort of the, the attempt that I try to do in these books. Right. So somehow that, that space for imagination can help reveal something of the bigger yeah, truth. And, and the last thing I'd say about this is because living in Pakistan, you're always told what you're supposed to do. Right. You know, life here is about, you know, who should you marry and uh, what job should you do and how should you dress and how should you behave and, you know, with whom should you or should you not have sex. And, you know, this is, um, we're always told what to do in Pakistan. Right. Maybe everywhere is like this, but in Pakistan I feel very strongly. So I like the idea of writing novels that don't tell you what to do. Yeah. And I'm sort of about ask the question, so what do you want to do with this? Um, and that's what I try to do. Okay. Um, Tanya, your, your version of, of this constructed reality involves, as we said, uh, getting inside different characters' heads, including the elephant. The, the truthfulness of it, although it's made up, comes from uh, your evidently intimate knowledge of, of how elephants can be, for example, chopped up in a post-mortem when they're trying to find a bullet that the poachers used and the extraordinarily accurate language you use about the sound that it makes when they start sawing open the elephant's skin, or, or the smell that a rotting elephant makes when it's been shot dead. Um, so you've created something which, which feels true, even though it's made up. What, how did you get to that, uh, how did you get that extraordinary knowledge? Have you, have you been an elephant, uh, in elephant conservation? I wasn't allowed. You're not allowed unless you're part of the veterinary team to do a to do a postmortem, so I just kept asking questions and questions. And I think that um, these people who do these postmortems were confused about why I kept asking the same questions over and over. Because what I'm looking for is not necessarily an accurate telling. I'm looking for some weird thing that they don't recognize as that weird because they've been doing it so long. So, you know, if well, I was interviewing a guy who 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 works in um, wildlife crime, and I was trying to get him to tell me what it's like to bust, um, you know, poachers. And he, you know, was kind of glazing over things. And But then at one point he said, um, you know, in these workshops, they even save the shavings of ivory that um, come off when they're, you know, cutting up tusks and things because some people believe that it helps with dandruff. Um, and I thought that's great. That's exactly what I'm looking for, that weird thing that I would never be able to find on my own. And in fact, the, the, the research, those kind of things, I think, um, are easier to find and easier to portray than um, what we're talking about, what most of us are talking about, politics. Um, for me, I 
found it a lot harder to get people in a room talking about the political backdrop or getting a sense or portraying a sense of what the political backdrop is like. And um, I had in my first draft a long session, um, which I loved this scene uh, because it, it was a scene where they screened the documentary film and it was a Q&A kind of like this one. And it was, um, I, I thought it was just a way for characters to kind of interrogate each other and my editor was like nobody really cares about this only you care about this and so I kind of had to find ways to sort of inject this sort of um, information about the sort of ecological you know backdrop in, in dialogue or in weird ways but I find it you know I, I just think fiction is is really given to that close-up de fine detail but it's a lot harder to get people to um, talk in a way uh, in a way that doesn't feel heavy and expositional but is honest I mean it's true people people these things come up in conversation about who has the right to this land and why you know um, why why are elephants more important than us people who've been living here for generations so so how to bring these things into a novel um, and still have it feel like it's coming from the character and not from me an author who's trying to you know inform you about what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You achieved it brilliantly, that it's kind of a fine balance. Ned, your, your novel is um, very different from the, other the others that we've been talking about in that it is, it's not really a realist novel. It's, it's, a, it's a comedy. It's surreal in all sorts of ways. And it, one of the elements of the novel is teleportation, actually moving things from one place to another. It jumps through time. It's completely dreamlike in, in certain ways. Um, and so the question really is, is about how you achieve that, that sort of illusion, illus illusory quality in the construction of the novel. Well, uh, one of the inspirations for the book actually was um, this uh, California Institute of Technology rocket scientist called Jack Parsons, um, who was operating, I think, in the 1950s, who was uh, researching new rocket fuels, um, there was also a follower of the Satanist, Alistair Crowley, um, and he believed that research into rocket fuels was in some way a sort of sacrament relating to whatever dark cosmic forces uh, Satanists were trying to get in touch with. And he didn't see the kind of distinction between laboratory science and sort of hieratic religion that we would, I imagine, be inclined to. Um, so I wanted to write about him, but it couldn't be about rocket science exactly, because uh, that would be too obvious. So I thought about making about ghosts, and in the end, uh, I settled on teleportation, sort of for American dream reasons, in the sense that um, uh, you know, migration is about being uprooted from one place and moved to another place and put down before you even know what's happened, uh, rather like teleportation. And then once teleportation was in there, I thought, why not ghosts and why not time travel and so on. But then I think that's partly because uh, this Weimar Berliner coming to California and getting involved with Caltech, which at that time and actually still is one of the most advanced centers of pure scientific research in the world. Um, and this is the era of pulp, I mean, sort of pulp fiction and uh, amazing stories, the famous anthology magazine and H.P. Lovecraft and so on. So I felt like for someone uh, coming from um, Europe at that time and coming to California, it would feel like anything was possible to the extent that even the laws of physics might be called into question. And of course, this is also the time of Einstein and von Braun, and von Braun, who of course also ended up in America, and Einstein ends up in America, um, and so on. So I thought, uh, if there's going to be and, you know, even Hitler, who looms in the background of the novel, was himself a kind of mystic. And as we know from 
uh, Indiana Jones, but it is actually true. Um, believe that the war might be won with kind of ancient biblical weapons. So it felt like if you're going to write a historical novel about any periods, weirdly the 1930s and 40s, which we think of a time of rationalism, did feel like one where we could believe that there might be kind of strange new forces uh, complicating the old European materialism. <laughs> and, and with that, having journeyed through around the globe uh, and, and back and forth in time, I'd like to open this conversation up to you. And if there are any questions, would you please raise your hand? And uh, I can see one in the third row here. If we can get a roving mic to there, and we'll come back to you, sir, in a second. Um, keep your questions brief, if you don't mind, because we've got so much to talk about in this event. As you have already mentioned, the idea of the uh, American dream, which is perceived in our part of the world, is that to become rich, to be a filthy rich. And I believe that this is actually leading to our youngsters to becoming more, uh, less moral and having no values. So I, want, I have a question from all of you that how the idea of uh, individuals is good to be like becoming rich, but how the aspect of contributing back to the society, like Nash, for youngsters to work towards the national interest, how can that be ingrained in our youngsters, which I think you as writers can make more good way you can talk about it. Okay, did you hear the question? Yeah. yeah. About how uh, the, there's a, a moral problem of those in, individualism. No, how uh, the idea of uh, contributing back uh, yeah. as, like, na to work for the national interest of the society or contributing back to the society can be communicated to the youngsters. How, how as a writer can you make a contribution, contribute back against this force of, of the immorality of individualism? Tanya, you look like you want to answer that. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think that um, I don't really feel that it's my, um, I don't feel the burden to um, kind of get people to, um, y you know, to move, you know, I, I feel like morality is a tough word, um, and it's not really my territory as a... Wow. Everyone's okay, I think. Yeah. Um, Nobody got hurt. Sort of, you know, what, what is, I mean, you asked the question of how can you, you know, um, in a way, how can you do good things to youngsters? How can you help people become better people? How can you help the country and all these sorts of things? And I think that, you know, one thing is, you know, you can ask a writer that question directly, which is, what would you do to make youngsters do something differently? And that's a difficult question to answer. But, and often in Pakistan, we think of that in, in almost like the sort of uh, the propaganda value of literature. You know, how can you make people think differently about something? And that, of course, is important and people debate whether they think it should be done or shouldn't be done. But a, se but a second thing about it, which I think literature does do, is, you know, it, it, it teaches you that, you know, that there are different points of view and that you can express your own point of view and that you can encounter very different perspectives on things. And that doesn't directly translate to doing more for society. Um, but generally, most societies are organized in a way where the system is built to support the powerful. And, and so what's being talked about, what's permitted to talk about generally is stuff that supports what is powerful. In Pakistan's case, you could say, you know, rich um, elite Pakistanis, you could say a defense establishment, you could say a certain kind of religious tradition. And so I think what novels do, they don't have to necessarily say, look, you know, you should give more to society, you should not just be concerned about wealth. What novels can also say is, look, you can think whatever the hell you want. You don't have to think what people are telling you to think. And then let the kids figure out for themselves what they think they should do and what they want to do. Which is not the same as saying, hey, don't pursue money. But it's saying, you know, figure out for yourself what you want to pursue. And I think many young people you know, do figure out to pursue other things. And, but I, I think that's a slightly different way in which fiction literature operates, not prescribing a course of action to people, but sort of reminding everybody that you know, they, can do, they can sort of do or think the way they want to. So, so it's a great question, but you're saying novelists can only provide part of the answer. Readers have to complete. Well, it's something which comes up a lot in Pakistan, which is this conversation around, you know, are you giving good values as a writer? And I think um, we can debate what good values are, 
but I think opening up the space to discuss many di more different points of view about values is also very helpful. And I think that's something that leadership does do, even if we can argue about what good values you know are or are not. Okay. I mean, I, I, um, oh. can we? Uh, because we've got lots of questions, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Can we get a microphone to the front row here, please? Okay. I am Sahar Sanya, and I uh, here I am. Okay. I wanted to ask a question uh, from Mohsin Hamid. Uh, first of all, you were uh, talking about that, uh, about the characters that you, did, you didn't want to choose the sides um, about the character. Uh, I wanted to ask if it is even possible uh, on the behalf of writer that he don't choose uh, sides. Because at the end we uh, kind of feel that the writers, like uh, all of your writers from your novels somehow choose or take sides. It somehow gets biased. And the, my question is, if it is really possible for the writer not to take sides of like um, any part of any place, is it even possible? I, mean, I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think there is such a thing as unbiased writing. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, it would be very dangerous for a writer to claim that they are, you know, unbiased. We each have whatever our biases are. Um, I think, though, that when you talk about taking, taking sides, um, I mean, certainly I do have points of view about the different political and economic issues that come up, you know, in, in, my, in my books. Um, but, but in a way, um, I also write non-fiction articles, I write essays where I sort of say, hey, here's what I think about something. Um, I don't think that's really what novels can do best. I think, I think novels, in a way, are, are two-person entertainments which involve a reader and a writer. And the writer provides half of that, like a dance partner, and the reader then does something else with that. And that particular dance between those two people becomes the novel as that person reads it. And so, for me, the goal isn't to say, hey, here's my unbiased point of view, but, but to say that, you know, let's dance together with this book and see what happens. I mean, I think that's what the objective is. And, and to keep it open enough that that dance can happen, as opposed to saying, you know, you can only dance this way in response to my book. Okay, most I'm, I'm sorry to, to cut you off. We, we're getting signs a bit. We've only got time for one more question. So, quick question in the front row here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this whole idea of nationalizing a dream sounds very political. So, my question to Tanya, I mean, is the elephant an Indian elephant? Is it a political elephant or what sort of elephant? Is it a political elephant? Um, I think uh, it is an Indian elephant. Do you mean that literally? Like it, what was the past of this particular elephant? What passport does this elephant have? <laughs> he is a South Indian elephant. Um, he used to be a captive elephant and that is the source of his trauma. Uh, yeah. The cover of the book has an African elephant okay. photograph. Okay, I'm being out of here. I get, yeah, mistake, I get a lot of insults right? about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an Asian elephant. Okay, I, I, we, we, we could have gone on for another hour with this, it's such a big topic, but sadly we have to call a close to it. But it's been a really fascinating session and thank you so much to the three authors. <laughs> thank you. Big round of applause. And I must say, please, please do buy their books because they're really, really good. Thanks. <laughs>